So, um, I'm going to um, give you some terminology because we will need to use it while we talk about later on about silent stage. So there are uh, two uh, main general uh, terms for language development uh, is receptive language and expressive. Uh, do you guys follow me okay? Do you need anything to be cleared? Okay, yeah, if not, then just switch on microphones and tell Dan Jane, slow down. I don't understand, don't be shy, okay? Just let me know. Okay, so um, why are we talking about receptive and expressive language? Firstly, uh, because uh, receptive language is the language of the database, of our database in, in mind. So um, when uh, does it start? It's a very tricky question because scientists are trying to find out when it really starts. And some, most of the scientists now um, think that it starts in prenatal stage. So when we are pregnant women, yeah, when we have a baby, uh, the baby can hear what we say. So most of the research is inclined that it actually starts at the very early stage of pregnancy. So when, when the child's hearing is formed, they can actually listen to sounds and mom's voice. And this is when they start to actually hear sounds. Uh, and actual building of receptive language starts when the child is born. So the communication is actually begins in the uterus, yeah? So when the child is in mom's womb. Uh, and then the child is born, he starts communicating by crying expressing himself, um, you know, how kids cry uh, differently um, for different issues, you know, like the hunger cry or some sort of um, you know, not happy cry. Uh, this is kind of communication. And this is also receptive language because the child has database in his mind that he should communicate it this way. And then the mom comes and helps. All right, but the actual uh, building of long-term memory starts around six months, uh, which means um, that from six, six and eight months depends um, on the child because every child is individual. Uh, they start building the database that they will be using later on, not straight away. And this is where we come across to expressive language, this thing. So then they start using the language, it's called expressive language. Okay, then they start telling their thoughts and needs and things like that. Um, what happens uh, next, um, I'll just show you. So by the age of two, they should be able to express at least one word sentence. Okay, uh, I just lost my timer, that's okay. Um, so, uh, it's actually very general information. So at least means that some kids will start talking by one, uh, by year one year, uh, with one word sentence. Some will start a bit later. With bilingual kids, uh, usually if they are exposed to, uh, a, another background, uh, say to English speaking background, um, and they used to speak their home language. It usually happens uh, a bit later. So say if your child uh, is around one and a half and he start, started to talk um, one word sentence, then you place them in the child care around two. They may get into the silent stage that we will talk about a bit later uh, and uh, stop talking. Yeah, for a while because they need to build their database of the words. Do you guys have any questions? Anything to ask? Okay, or maybe comment, that's fine. But if, for example, I have a situation when they uh, haven't spoken from the very beginning, and so he is now four, for example, and he can't speak English at all. So it is the same situation or different? Sorry, who is that talking? <laughs> Can you guys switch on camera when you talk? Because I can't uh, address. Is it okay? uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't, um, I don't understand who I'm talking to. Is it? Uh... So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, my son, for example, because 
when he was two, he didn't he didn't speak English at all. Yeah. So is is it uh, the same situation or different? Can I ask your name? Your name? I can see who I'm talking to. What's your name? <laughs> yeah, my uh, my name is my name is Valentina. Yeah. Ah, Valentina. Yeah, yeah. I I got it. Yeah. Uh, Valentina, yeah, I uh, think we better talk about it about when we go to silent stage. But yes, I can answer your question. If he didn't uh, start talking uh, at the age by the age of, I mean, if you were talking Russian, as I understand, you speak Russian, yeah. As yes. Well, yeah. So if you were talking Russian at home, uh, and he started to speak one word sentence, is it what you're saying? No, he didn't. I mean, when he was he two, for example, because you are talking about the age of two, yeah? Yeah, so he didn't. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's he didn't. Telling, yeah, he didn't. So that's why I'm telling that some children, especially boys, they will start talking a bit later, okay? It's uh -huh. individual. The girls usually start talking earlier, like around one, uh, and the boys have different, uh, the girls and the boys have different uh, parts of brain responsible for the talk. I mean, they have the same parts of brain, but they have different um, hormones responsible for socializing. Yeah. The boys uh, really want to socialize till the age of two and a half, three, and they don't have that necessity to actually talk. But it's a very different story. I'll tell about uh, that a bit later in the lecture, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, so, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So by the age two, two to three, receptive is much wider than expressive. And expressive is approximately 300 uh, to 900 words. Uh, so what happens? But receptive language that we have talked about um, is actually the language of database. And if you probably, as parents, uh, already came across with that terrible twos, Put your thumbs up if you had your child going on the floor crying and screaming, was trying to tell something but you didn't get it, and then they start having that hysterical thing. Did anyone uh, have it? Like, you know, then they start, yeah, yeah. Then they start um, crying out of the blue. This is mainly happens because their receptive language at this age is actually wider than expressive. So they want to tell more and they know what the word means, but they can't really express it yet. Because we, you may be able to hear some cueing or some blurbs or, you know, some blurbing from the child. Uh, they, may try to, they may try to say some words that are not clear for you yet. As a parent, you may be able to actually pick it up and understand that this particular Tata, for example, means dad, or Tata means bottle or toy or something else. But uh, for most of the people, you, they won't be able to pick it up straight away. But at the same time, you don't know all the words because then, it starts, then the child starts blurbing, then they start saying words by kind of parts of the words that are not recognizable. Then it's the most difficult time for the parent to actually address, you know, to the child and uh, try to communicate with him, same with him or her, and same with the child. It, it's very hard for the child to actually express their feelings because nobody can understand. And that's why we come across with terrible twos between two to three. It will go away but as soon as they get their expressive language. And at, at the age of three uh, and a half, three to five, this is called preschool age. This is actually the first part here is called um, toddlers, yeah, or your child will go to toddler room. Uh, they don't talk too much, they play in a parallel play, uh, so that means they don't play with each other, but they mainly play um, by the side of someone else because they can't really yet talk, but they want to play, they learn from each other, uh, and their long-term memory is still developing. While uh, in the preschool age, they really have that desire to actually go and talk. Uh, because uh, the expressive language comes up, they've got the new concept that they can talk and they get a uh, reaction from other people when they talk and they understand that actually this is a good idea to actually talk. Uh, so by the age, I mean, around three to five, the child should be able uh, to talk 900 to 1,500 words. Okay, oh, sorry guys, I think somebody else is trying to... 
Okay, excellent. All right, let's move on. Oh, okay. So over five, as soon as we go to school, uh, after five, they actually start blurting and talking. Um, guys, do I, can I please, you can switch your microphones on and can I ask you what are uh, the age groups of your children? Interesting. I've got in my care uh, who have three languages as well. Uh, and, uh, and plus, they started to learn some Japanese at prep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is amazing. I have the child who speaks German, English, and Russian in my and he he's doing great. He's only yeah, uh, two exactly. and a half. He's two and a half, and he can actually understand and express himself in in language in three languages. Yeah, they absorb everything like sponge. Yeah. <laughs> Other people will who want. All right. Um, um, I'll come back to actually, it's very interesting that both parents are Russian, and I'll mention that and we'll go to different types of bilinguals. Okay, look, let's stop off right now uh, a bit um, uh, on the bilingualism priority or difficulty. Uh, okay. So um, what I'm trying to tell you today, guys, that we, uh, it's a good idea to actually try to preserve Russian language. And I think we all of you know, because I know some parents asked me, should I just refuse speaking English and I'm gonna help my child? Uh, I mean, sorry, refuse to speak Russian and I'm gonna help my child socialize better in the childcare environment uh, by uh, giving him more words in English. Well, I'll tell you why you shouldn't do that. Well, first of all, the first priority is bilingual children views of their language shape, negative or positive disposition towards their home language. And then children are encouraged to speak their home language. This fosters positive experiences with and dispositions towards the use of their language. Okay, that's like a lot of words, but I'll explain it in simple way. Uh, this means, usually means that if we start insisting on English, uh, and we are Russian, yeah, we have Russian background. Uh, we still will talk Russian uh, with our family or with someone. And uh, what happens to a child within the age, they will, start, they will start thinking that speaking Russian is something not really, you know, nice. Uh, so they will kind of start losing their confidence from the beginning because when you start teaching them English, they feel like, okay, uh, they speak, they want to speak English and mom speaks English with accent or something like that, then I'm not going to bother speak Russian. You're going to firstly lose Russian and secondly, the child confidence may not be, uh, you know, quite good because they will uh, start getting embarrassing about you and it happens within age. So when you say proudly that, oh, look, let's speak Russian, it's such a great language, like and start reading the books and the child hears you reading and talking in Russian from a very early age, they will start loving it. I hope that's clear, yeah? Um, and they, within the age, they will be actually very proud that they um, speak this language and this is something that they want to talk. I tell you what, I used to work in a um, Russian uh, school, uh, Hombush, you probably, I don't know, but those people from Sydney probably know it. Uh, I was a choir teacher and I had a class about uh, 35 children, quite a lot. So I had classes by different age groups and they were coming and going and there were teenagers. I had teenagers in one of my class uh, and I asked them, why are you, uh, why are you uh, going to Russian school? Is it because your parents make you? And I was very much surprised when they told me that because we think we are different, it's quite cool. Okay. So they said, um, I, I, they were just proud of what they actually have in other language because it was cool to tell other people or tell something in Russian language in front of other Australian guys, you know, who can't talk English. <laughs> I mean, can't talk uh, other than English. Um, so this um, um, particular slide is done by uh, Jones Diaz. And I didn't tell you because I thought I wouldn't have time, but no. I can tell you because I've got it unlimited. Um, uh, I used to study in the University of Sydney. We had a huge training with this lady. She is specializing in bilingual children. And that's from her, one of her um, um, lectures. 
Yeah, so she was doing a study on the Spanish children. She was working with Spanish children for a while, and she had five uh, kids whose parents were emphasizing on learning Spanish, and she had another five kids uh, whose parents were actually trying to speak English at home, uh, with Spanish accents probably, but they kept speaking Spanish with each other. And this is how the children felt about themselves. So those, the group number one, they felt happy, free, good, normal, fun, great, smart, proud, and confident. And group number two uh, felt weird, crazy, and different. So this is how, this is why I'm explaining about self-confidence. Because when we are, the child will still know that you have different background. And if uh, you kind of try to hide that, then they start feeling like this, okay? So probably not a good idea. Okay, next one. Uh, we're talking about priorities and benefits a bit further. So I uh, hope you heard about this terminology, but in general, first language development facilitates second language learning. So it's interesting. It actually was in the research somewhere that then uh, the child uh, learns one language, then somehow, uh, and it's another environment. Yeah, so if we speak home language and the child knows there is another environment, he somehow quicker get the second language. Okay, despite the silent stage and everything, because silent stage only lasts until school year uh, one, kindergarten. Yeah, uh, later on I'll explain why. And uh, partly dependent upon conceptual development and proficiency already achieved in the first language. Uh, early literacy learning is enhanced by early bilingual experiences. I know it sounds a bit funny, uh, maybe not really clear. I'll explain what, why. Have you guys heard about flexibility of mind terminology? Uh, ребят, можете включить микрофон и ответить мне. <laughs> Have you heard of flexibility of mind? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. I think it's just like a recent, a recent experience here in uh, science. Yeah, yes, it's actually, it's been for a while in the science, yes. Uh, the flexibility of mind uh, is um, when you learn with child something academically. Yeah, like say you learn math. Then uh, the child is able to transfer, yeah, to transfer this concept, this concept is conceptual, yeah, development, uh, to uh, another, any language. So say if you start from now, you want your child to start, say, reading, and I actually work with the child who can read in Russian, but he uh, can't, like he was not familiar with English, he is doing so fast uh, because he is learning English as his second language. He's done so fast in reading sentences. However, he uses a different mythology. Uh, in English, we, I mean, it's a bit different story, but in English, they learn it with spelling words and sight reading and things like that. But in, um, uh, in Russia, we, we read by syllabus. So he's funny, he's reading English words by syllabus, but he's doing great. He's actually- yeah, my, my daughter, my first daughter, yeah, did the same. She starts to read Russian about four, and then th then she comes to school. She uh, b before school she start by syllables. And yeah. yeah, yeah. This is flexibility of mind because they transfer it very easily, uh, and um, ability to switch from one language to another. This is actually a very amazing thing. Uh, this is when we will be talking about balanced bilinguals. Um, say my daughter, she's twelve years old. Uh, and she um, can speak uh, two languages equally likely. So she's balanced bilingual and she's working for me now and teaches kids to speak English. She's only 12, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah, because she can switch from one language to another easily without any accent and have fluent speech, you know, fluent speech that she uses in school and everywhere. And we have that project there, kids talk to Russian kids uh, in, in Russia, to help them to understand fluent speech and this is amazing i think if you say the language then you can easily do this thing with your child <laughs> and the child is very happy about himself or herself that they can do that so identity and family links identity it's what we talked about the self-esteem this is self-esteem here as well uh family links like how are you going to talk with your grandmas 
you know, if you don't know Russian and yeah, <laughs> and they don't speak English. So societal economic gains, that means that, you know, the child can go to Moscow and start working for Moscow because he's more Russian. And here we go. Finally, uh, we are here, uh, bilingualism main types. So what I want, why I actually ask you to share your stories, what languages you speak, I mean, at home, and uh, what your age group of kids, because we are going to talk about this. So there are two main types of bilinguals, but in some uh, resources you may find more information or about more uh, different types, other types, but the main types, and I like that uh, kind of um, uh, division between simultaneous and successive because it explains mainly everything. So the simultaneous bilinguals are those uh, who come from the families uh, where one parent, and I think we had one, we have one family uh, uh, who was that, uh, who has a Spanish uh, husband. Who was that? Uh, sorry, I put it down, but my writing is so messy. I was Tanya, yeah? No, not Tanya. I think Tanya. No, no, not me. It was some um, someone else. Oh, someone sorry. Who's it? Yeah. Nata oh, Natasha, maybe. Yeah, with an Italian husband. Oh, Italian, yes. Oh, sorry, Italian. Yeah. <laughs> Italian, yes. Italian, yes, not Spanish, Italian. I can yeah. talk about Spanish before, but yeah. So you are actually simultaneous bilinguals. Which yes, means... so yeah, Russian and Italian was simultaneous, and now plus English, it would be like a, a third yeah. one, yeah. So this type of bilinguals, uh, they are actually the hardest to save our main language. So, do you guys speak English at home? No. Communicate with each other? Uh, we speak Italian. We are, as a family language, as Italian language. As mm -hmm. I speak Italian. My husband doesn't speak Russian. I see. So, no, then you're not simultaneous, but you're still successive. Because okay. simultaneous bilinguals, uh, they're those people who actually, want, where one person speaks uh, the language of the environment, the general environment. So, say Australian, uh, okay. yeah, mm -hmm. Australian dad, and say Russian, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, maybe then we are an example of simul uh, simultaneous because my husband is Australian and I'm uh -huh. Russian speaking. Sorry, who is that talking? Is it Lola? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So you'd be this uh, type of bilingual. Uh, what it means uh, that it is a bit harder for you to actually say the language, um, the Russian language, a home language at home. How old is your child? Sorry. Uh, he's five. Five. Okay. Um, can I, I, can I, sorry, is someone talking or is it the child? Uh, yes, it's a child who's actually speaking Russian. So. Uh, Okay, so my question is, what language does he talk? Well, he's uh, kind of fully bilingual. He speaks Russian with me and he speaks English with his dad. Because I say, I, I'd shake your hand that you're <laughs> able to say the language. Because most of the families that come across to me, and from what I've seen from my practical experience, uh, I've seen um, it's, it was very difficult for the parents to save language to save home language for the mom, because uh, what children do, they're very sneaky. <laughs> they like, they understand the environment quite quickly. Uh, they uh, know that it is easy to express myself in English, and they switch to uh, the environment, I mean, to the language of the environment. So I'll give you the example. I had a child, um, he wanted my care from uh, eight, around eight months. Uh, and uh, the idea was to actually for him English. Um, however, um, yes, and his family is uh, mom is Russian and uh, dad is Australian. And between those those two, they spoke in the family. They obviously spoke English. Uh, mom's English is very good as well. Uh, and the idea to go to my because I'm Russian family daycare. The idea uh, to go to my care was actually to uh, make the child talking Russian, of course. They were four days a week here and the child started to talk Russian. It was amazing, he had one word sentences in Russian, was pointing, I was very happy. And then out of the blue, uh, I, I had another, actually, 
had another girl who had at the same time as I had the boy, uh, who was um, um, Australian. She had Australian background, but uh, parents wanted her to start speaking Russian because she came at nine at the age of eight, eight months. I mean, eight months. Yeah, to get the same age as uh, the other boy. Um, and she started to talk. Russian. Amazingly, the Australian girl <laughs> started to talk Russian because it was also four days a week. And then one day when she grew up a bit, uh, she, uh, because the girls have that, as I mentioned, has that uh, necessity and wanting, a desire to actually communicate a bit earlier, she started to communicate at around two, I'd say. Uh, and quite good, while Simon was still uh, not actually producing any words. And because her parents could not support her Russian, she switched to English from what all my efforts were in vain. And she speak to English and she started to bring English to my care. And Simon, who started to speak Russian, he switched to English because um, the family, he uh, actually cleared it out that uh, I can speak and Jane can understand because I was using with the other girl, I was using some English words. Uh, he was very clever. He understood that I, I understand English. He sorted it out very quickly and switched into English. I mean, this was very sad for the family. <laughs> and they tried to bring him back. And then mom started to insist on Russian language. And then she started to insist what we ended up. He was talking Russian to mom and was replying English to me because he knew that Tilly was there and she was speaking English and I was replying English to her. So kids are very smart. Uh, and that's why I'm saying we have to keep doing our best to actually speak Russian at home. You are guys, those successive bilinguals, and most of us here today are successive bilinguals as far as, as I understand. Uh, nod your heads if you're, if you, yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> okay, so which means we are Russian families and we are lucky that we can actually um, preserve that language and uh, we can support the child at home. When he comes back from preschool or the childcare or, you know, um, nursery, we still, even nursery, even uh, the babies, you know, you still have to address in Russian language. Uh, and uh, I think Lola is doing great that she was able to preserve Russian language. And this is, Lola, is your child talking, uh, can you say he's having accent or he's not having accent or anything? Um, he doesn't really have an accent um, in English. It's a girl. Russian. Did you say she? Sorry. Uh, he. He's a boy. Ah, he. Okay. He, but yeah. we, I do think that we need to take him to a speech therapist because he has trouble with some of the letters. So it's not the accent, it's more some of the sounds he struggles. In you mean to Russian speech therapist? Um, well, probably both because there's some sounds in English that he also struggles with. Okay. Look, some sounds, and I specialize in speech development as well, uh, some sounds shouldn't come up, uh, well, they should come up uh, five. If you're talking about sh and ch sounds, uh, then you shouldn't worry until he turns five or six or a bit later. Mm -hmm. so thing for you to, you know, but it's a good idea to check anyway. There is actually free assessment. In Sydney, I don't know which state are you from, but yes, I'm from awesome. I'm from Victoria, and we were advised to go, and we were gonna go before the whole COVID thing, and now I guess we're gonna go a bit later. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with Victoria. Sorry, guys, but okay. we'll, I, if you guys have any questions about where speech assessment can be done, you just put down in the chat, and I give you an address or some information if you would like to do that. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, let's move on. So guys, uh, one more thing, very important thing. In successive bilinguals, so they study English as a second language and identify more strongly with one language. So probably the home language initially, uh, and then they go to school, they may switch to another language, but usually if we support Russian, then they have what we call balanced bilingual. And the most important thing, what we're gonna talk about today is this. Can you guys all see that? It's oopsie daisy. What did I do? It's a silent stage, yeah? So those types of bilinguals, they usually go through silent stage. Sometimes it happens to simultaneous, but I've seen it very rare. It's very unlikely. Um, however, uh, the successive bilinguals will do. 
Okay, children's experiences of bilingual, bilingual situations. Uh, what is meant by here? So, what happens to successive bilinguals or simultaneous bilinguals sometimes? So, uh, the positive thing about uh, the additive thing about successive, typically for successive bilinguals, the home language is maintained and developed as English is acquired effectively. So, which means like the child speaks Russian and they go to the childcare center and they acquire some English words. So, you know, you, your child started, say, your child started a childcare in like one month ago, then he starts bringing, he may, he may go through the silent stage. Not all kids go through silent stage, but most kids do. And say in three months, he starts bringing one word uh, in English, yeah? Uh, or two word sentences, it depends on the age. And we'll have a look at the study um, of uh, which age actually is more prominent in the silent stage. And the balanced uh, is equal proficiency in both languages. Very few bilingual children attain this level of balance between their languages. It's more typical for simultaneous because they can hear two languages, but they end up with this, usually with this. Yeah, okay. Uh, then the child is unable to produce speech and has a receptive level only. So for Lola, for example, uh, if you stop supporting Russian language and later on you don't go to Russian school, uh, when the child goes to um, school, because uh, he's five now, is he at school yet? Or, or you said he's in childhood, yeah? So he's currently going to kinder, but he actually started Russian school this year. Oh, so okay. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, that's why. <laughs> now I see that's why he's speaking good Russian. Yeah, so, but if you don't have that, uh, the thing is that the environment takes over uh, and uh, the environment is school. When they start school, they have to do lots of homework, they have to do lots of listening and talking. They switch to uh, English. So they can't be balanced bilinguals. However, with successive bilinguals, they can be balanced uh, because uh, l later on they can be balanced. So what happens? Then the child before five, uh, they're si si simultaneous bilinguals from simultaneous bilingual families. Balanced. But then the situation reverses. Then the child is a bit over and they go to school. Uh, their English starts getting um, upper, you know, they start speaking a bit more English. And the successive bilinguals who had a bit of struggle with saying something, blah, blah, uh, they actually become balanced bilingual. This is what happened to my daughter. Uh, she's, we, we are both Russians, so we have uh, Russian language at our home all the time from birth. And uh, she is now balanced bilingual, that's why she can actually switch from one language to another. All right, and it's a subtractive. English is learned at the expense of the home language. Uh, so this is when it usually happens um, when parents stop supporting it. Uh, it's quite hard when they go to school. I tell you, my kids are 12 and 14 now. And uh, if we don't stop them speaking English at home, you know, two sisters, they speak uh, English to each other. If we don't stop it, like we say, switch to Russian, especially when they come to my childcare, uh, and I can hear them <laughs> speaking English. I always stop them because my other kids, little kids, they pick up from all the girls very quickly. I stop them and I say, speak Russian now. And then they switch to Russian. Um, so this is what's happening right now in my family, getting subtractive. Okay, so we don't want that. We will try to emphasize on speaking English better. So uh, what parents, community attitudes, a bit of community attitudes. That's how much time do you have us? Um, uh, post, pass on positive attitudes about your language and culture. So this is how parents can support um, your language and why we should do that. Uh, point out advantages of bilingualism to a child. So how we actually help child to understand that he or she, why she needs to talk this language. Point out the value and usefulness of your language. Talk to child give a teacher about the benefits of child bilingualism. Pass on positive attitudes uh, about bilingualism to others in your community and read and find out more information. Yeah, this is what we're actually doing right now, uh, trying to find more information. This is by Chris Jones Dyes that I, ah, uh, Western Sydney. Well, she's from Western Sydney, but we have this in the University of New South Wales, I think. University of Sydney, sorry. 
Okay, so there are some difficulties. Um, the child is successive bilingual can fall into silent stage. This is what I mentioned before. And we're gonna to talk to about silent stage and ideas how to help child uh, to get rid of, I mean, go out of the silent stage. Uh, in some cases, my last for more than six months. Well, to be honest, guys, I've seen, um, this is, uh, this is for the child who's withdrawn. I've seen the child who was withdrawn, uh, which means he wasn't talking or communicating with anyone at six for six for longer than six months. But in general, uh, the signs of, uh, silent stage, they can stay, uh, till one year. If, if the child constantly exposed to English speaking environment, it's not like you place the child in the childcare and then you pull them out because you thought, oh no, that's not right because he's in silent stage and then you place them back. Um, so they are the maximum that I've seen with the child who's constantly exposed to English speaking environment was one year with some behavioral issues and things like that. And I'm going to talk about, uh, if the speech delay presents from birth, having two languages won't extend speech delay. So, um, I know some of you uh, mentioned, or somebody mentioned that you're going to see a speech therapist. Uh, Lola, I think you did, did you? Yeah, you said that. Um, it's nothing to do with you, but I'm just saying that some parents who are concerned, because you have consonants problems, you have some pronunciation stuff, but I've seen kids who have speech delay, um, and it's quite unclear, to be honest, uh, to find out if the child has speech delay till the age of three, four, when the child should start talking and you don't know why he's to keep silence. There could be different reasons, could be some hearing problems. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily that he can't hear, but he may have a glue ear, for example, uh, which means uh, he can't hear properly or hear only 50%. And then he starts talking words and um, there would be uh, some sort of uh, pronunciation that, that is not clear, but by the age of three, it should be clear, guys. Uh, but having two languages won't extend speech delay. What happens when you take out the other language? Uh, you just take the other language out. You don't actually uh, deal with speech delay because if the child was born with speech delay, you can't really uh, change him. You can't really help him. You can help him to do the speech therapy and try to work in, but if you're taking one language out, you won't get rid of speech delay. So I don't recommend uh, to uh, take the other language away um, because you're just losing the language and you won't be able to bring it. This is only for child with a speech delay, with minor speech delay, but not with child with autism, okay? Because kids with autism, they, they are treated very different. Okay, um, it still should mention here that this is quite controversial because um, there are some studies, um, there's some, some psychologists, I don't know if they're not qualified, but we had someone, uh, uh, one of the parents who was telling that her psychologist told her to get rid of the other language. Uh, I don't know that it has to do with professionalism or something like that, and they didn't know, uh, or they just didn't want to bother. But they say, some psychologists say, take another language out and it will help. Uh, according to uh, Jones Dias, so you're another lady who I was talking to, uh, she says that it's not going to work. And I should tell you that it's actually not uh, make any difference. All right. If the child for any reason did not have enough exposure to English speaking environment before starting school, can have some difficulties communicating. This is quite obvious. Uh, and, um, of course, if, uh, we've got so many parents who come from Russia and they go to school straight away, I mean, kids go to school straight away, uh, they, uh, don't have, uh, English, enough English, but, uh, given the age group, uh, they will pick up language very quickly. And usually ESL support is offered. The end of session one. So we're going to talk about balance stage in more details in session two.